Williams and the introduction in this room. Uh, Julia Lynn, I will be. Thank you. And, and I want to start by, by congratulating PAC for actually organising this meeting um, and to congratulate all of you for actually turning up on a Saturday morning. Because we're an audience of the size that we are, what would be good is to have some sort of dialogue. But I do just want to put this into some sort of context of the, 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 the scale of the, the attack as I see it. And I'm going to start with the constituency bill. You might sort of want to be like, well, I know why I start with the constituency bill. Because, of course, this is one of the things that um, got the, the coalition, the Lib Dems, on board with the Tories, which was about um, a referendum on AV. But to just show perhaps how weak that coalition is in some ways, is, the Tories have agreed to put forward a bill on AV, but have said that they will campaign against AV when the referendum comes round. So they're not even saying, you know, we'll jointly go on this thing, or we'll go on is, is having a, a, a referendum. But what the constituency bill also does, it re reduces the number of MPs to 600. Um, now, some people in the room might go, well, that's a really good thing. But actually, if you look back, we've now got, each MP has now got 25% more constituents than, than MPs had in the 1950s. And if you look at now, the, the fact that people expect their MP to be accessible through email, telephone, surgeries, all of those other things, there's that a totally different expectation than there was on MPs in the past. To then say, okay, well, we can all deal with more people. Well, okay, there's an argument for that. However, they're going to set the target of 75,000 people per constituency this December, when we know that there are millions of people not on the electoral register. And those millions of people are mainly low-income people, students and um, uh, BME, uh, black minority ethnic people. So they're going to set, so potentially in this area here, we could actually have real constituencies of some 80 plus thousand people. Whereas in, in other places, the constituencies are, are where it's um, Sartoria is particularly, or so the more, more leafy suburbs, more people that tend to be registered to vote. And then they're going to gerrymander the constituencies, basically, because they're not going to allow any local inquiries into them. Now, if you look, the last time we went through this, when Atherton, that bit of Atherton actually went into Old West, there was a public inquiry that lasted three weeks in Manchester, Town Hall, because it was about the whole of Greater Manchester. There were 600 submissions to that uh, inquiry, 190 people attended, and there were 16 alternatives put forward. So there was a democratic process in place, and that democratic process is now being removed from this. And what has been said is that there is this real belief that, that yes, some Labour constituencies will be strengthened, but also they will make sure that there are other constituencies that are also strong. So it won't be about saying, let's have lots of marginals, it will be about gerrymandering. So I just want to start on, on that one, and then move on to welfare reform. There's a, an interesting document that we've given on Thursday, and I actually asked the question, I asked the question um, because it says the government's committed to ensure that no one loses a direct result of these reforms. However, over the page, it then says we're going to cap household benefit, we're going to withdraw child benefit, um, we're going to have measures to control the cost of tax credits and time limiting um, other allowances. So I asked the question to say, well, how can you say that, that you're not going to affect anybody by these changes? But then say that you're going to do this. And of course, what they're saying is they're going to re reduce the welfare bill. The minister said, no, no, everybody, nobody will lose out by these changes. So I'm glad that's on the record to say, because clearly we need to look and see who's going to lose out by these changes. And the point that you, you, you said about um, MPs supporting or, or agreeing with the welfare changes, there is a bit of it that we're saying, yeah, it's good. People should, in work, work should pay. Work should pay more than benefit. But that's actually making sure that work pays, not that benefits are reduced. And that's the fear, of course, if you reduce benefit rather than making work pay. And you know, they are saying that people keep more bits of their benefits. So, you know, overall you go, well, that bit's okay. Of course, the devil is always in the detail. But those other bits about capping housing benefits and, and doing some of those other things that they're doing, absolutely, they are all outraged. And actually, if people had, had watched the TV on, on Thursday morning, they'd have seen the number of, of, of Labour MPs that were leaping up and down and trying to get in touch and say, look, you know, there's an overall bit of making work pay that we agree with, but it's how you're going to do that is the thing that's desperately worrying for all of us. And, and there's a, this myth going around that housing benefit changes are actually going to really just affect London. And that is not true at all, because with the housing benefit changes, whereas people in private rented accommodation now, there is a, a sort of mean average of, of how much you can claim benefits up to. 
and that's 50% of private rented, uh, private rented rent for you know, flats, one bed houses, two bed houses, etc. What's going to happen with this reform is that that amount that people will be paid will be set at 30% of the average. So there's going to be a lot of people in, in houses that then their benefit will not, will not meet the cost for. And already there is sort of this myth as well that's going around that actually benefit, housing benefit is paid to people who don't work. Not true. There's nearly sort of 30% of the companies. Housing benefit is paid to people in work. It's an in-work benefit, not an out-of-work benefit. And then they're saying, um, after a year, your housing benefit will be cut by 10% if you haven't found a job. Well, for me, after a year is actually when you're most desperate for money. Most of us can cope with unemployment for a short period of time. But after the year, that's when your shoes have all worn out, your clothes have worn out, your appliances in the house have broken down. A time when you most need money. And at that point, they said, we're going to remove 10% of, 10 of your benefit. However, you know, and you, you know, have these jobs. Well, what jobs? When they're saying 500,000 public sector jobs are going to go, and the estimate is, just on the back of those public sector cuts, another 500,000 jobs in the private sector are going to go. And of course they're saying that the, public, the private sector is going to fill these jobs. But they're actually talking about, to, to enable them to do that, they're estimating growth higher than there's ever been since 1974. So even in those boom years that we did have under the Labour government, we didn't have growth as much as they're predict, predicting that we should have growth, growth now. Um, and the only time those growth figures were ever sort of exceeded was in the 1950s. So this is a real false premise, it feels to me, with all of that. So housing benefit, it is going to be an attack on us. And we will find people in our community, not just London, we'll find people in our community that are actually being made homeless from their houses. Our student fees you touched on, I was actually on the March on Wednesday, and I'm proud to have been on the March on Wednesday, because I do think it's important that we show solidarity. Because an awful lot of people, I signed a pledge before the election to say that I would vote against the increase in student fees. Um, as did every Lib Dem MP down there, and as did a large number of Tories, uh, Tory MPs. And, and we've got some photos somewhere, I think, of Nick Clyde signing the pledge, and Gary Alexander signing the pledge, and all these other people signing the pledge. And they got elected, often in largely student constituencies, because they said, yeah, we'll vote against the increase in fees. And now they're saying, ah, oh, well, we didn't know how bad it was going to be, so we're going to triple the fees. In fact, we are £10 billion less in debt after the election than before um, the election. Um, Stephen talked about support from the whole party. I mean, I'm heartened to see Labour Party members here and, and people from other organisations. But what I want to say is the Parliamentary Labour Party is together in terms of fighting these cuts. And I'll come on to say a little bit more about the cuts now. But I don't want it to be said that there is not that support. And I forgot to do this at the start, and I must apologise for this. I have also brought greetings from the three other members of Parliament for Wigan, um, Lisa, Yvonne, and, and, um, and Vernon, who um, haven't come today because it's in Atherton, but have been involved in, in speaking on other forums. <coughs> and we are determined to be collecting reform coalitions against the worst excesses of this government. The budget actually affected women three times more than it affected men. The CSR affected women and kids twice as much as it affected men. Children are now paying more to pay back on these cuts than the banks are paying. Now that for me just seems like that is utterly outrageous. When the government says, we're all in this together, well it's a bit like an animal farm, isn't it? But some of us are a bit more in it together than, than some of the others. They say that the recession was avoidable and the cuts are unavoidable. In fact, that's based it's inherent nonsense because we faced the, world, world, the worst world recession than we've had since sort of the 20s and 30s. If the government, if the Labour government hadn't acted to actually bail out the banks to invest in the, in the economy, we would have been in a depression. We would have been in a depression, you know, the 20s, 30s depression. There was no alternative, I believe, absolutely no alternative, but to um, put money into the economy at that point in time. So we would say, you know, the recession was unavoidable. And, and you know, people say, Gordon Brown caused this recession. Well, I know he was a very powerful man, but how did he cause a recession in America, Japan, France, Germany, the rest of the world? You know, he may be powerful, but he's not that bloody powerful. So, 
I believe that what this government's doing is actually taking a reckless gamble with our economy. Because what they are doing is cutting much deeper and faster. And they've actually said, you know, we think we're going to pay this money back in three years instead of four or five years. When you buy a house, you don't immediately the next day go and say, and here's the money for the house. You take out that mortgage according to how much you can actually pay on that mortgage. And what they're actually doing is risking our, our growth. And we're also going to have a 20% rise in VAT. We're going to have um, many, many hundreds of thousands of people who are out of work. And one fact to give you is for every 100,000 people out of work, it costs us half a billion pounds in benefits. So how putting all of these people out of work is actually going to um, grow the economy? <coughs> This is ideological. What they're doing is that it's, it is about dismantling the state. It is about smaller the state. And if you look at things like getting rid of the, the regional development agencies, regional development agencies, for every pound spent by the RDA, £4.50 comes back into our economy. But they're saying, well, we need to get rid of, of, of the RDAs. Getting rid of a whole tranche of bodies that actually are, are our interface with the government. And they're talking about the big society and local, localism. But actually what will happen is there will be more and more decisions actually taken in Whitehall rather than at a local level. They're talking, of course, about how you, really they don't want local authorities to be providers of services anymore. And you know, Wigan Council is going to have a big battle on its hands to be able to continue to provide services because Wigan is committed to be providing services, not just a commissioner of services. But the battle to do that is going to be very difficult. And there is this move to say, you know, you should be commissioners, not providers. NHS as well. You know, let's take the, let's take the national out of the NHS because it's now going to be divided, decided by um, GP consortia locally. But what they are then saying is, well, we'd like cooperatives to set up, but to, to deliver public services, or the private sector. However, this is on the back of huge cuts. So it seems to me that gas and electricity isn't going to be any cheaper. So the only thing that can be any cheaper in terms of delivering those services are staffing costs. So that means, again, it's an assault on the terms and conditions of people who work in the public sector. Because how else do you deliver the services if, if you know, these bodies that are going to deliver out here, whether they're charities, whatever they are, will actually be an assault on, on the terms and conditions. I did say I wasn't going to talk for very long, and I realise I have been, so I'm going to finish with just talking about what I believe that we should be doing. At the moment, the approval rate for the government is still extremely high. There's something like, I think, 59% of Labour voters are saying they approve of the cuts that the government's making. So that just shows the scale of, of, of the, the task for us to actually be talking to people and saying the cuts are avoidable, the, 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 the dismantling of the state is not inevitable, and actually we need that coalition of resistance. So the reason I'm happy to come and talk on platforms and to, be, to engage with people is because I actually think we need a coalition of resistance. And in the same way as I went to on the students' march on Wednesday, I believe it's about building a coalition of community groups, of trade unions, of politicians, to actually be putting that message across to people um, and to have that resistance, to be saying to the government, we don't agree with the dismantling of the state, we don't agree with what you're doing, and therefore, we believe there's a different way. And for me, that's not about violent protest. That's why I'm so angry with, with, with what a group of people did on Wednesday. But it is about, um, I think, building alliances and building coalitions. Which is why I'm really pleased that there is a coalition of people here. Um, and I'll be interested to see whether we're at the end of this, set, of this meeting, we've actually got lines that we can go forward on. Because I think one of the things that PAC has done is that we should we will, will be non-sectarian. I am prepared to stand on platforms um, and fight, but I'm not prepared to stand on platforms and fight where people are there slagging off the Labour Council. Because there is a reality for the Labour Council at this point in time. And it's like when you go to the supermarket and you really love to buy all of those fancy goods on the shelf, but you can't buy them because you haven't got your money in your purse. This council is not being given the money from the government to be able to continue to fund the services at the level it is. And if you do not have the money, you've got to make some hard choices. Uh, and therefore, that's why I'm, I'm prepared to, you're very, very happy to fight against the cuts. But I think it's got to be fighting against that common government. <coughs>